This is Buffalo State Data Talk, the podcast where we introduce you to how data is used and explore careers that involve data. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Buffalo State Data Talk. I'm your host, Heather Campbell, and thank you for joining us for episode two. Today, we will be talking to Jessica Weitzel, the president and co-owner of BIA Evaluations, a majority women-owned and led business located in Buffalo, New York. Thanks for joining us today, Jessica. Good to be here. So can you start us off by letting us know what kind of work VIA evaluation does? Yeah, so we usually just call it VIA. Some people say VIA, we just say VIA. Um, and the reason it matters is because our tagline is uh, the way to better results. Ah, and the okay. idea is using data to get to better results. Um, so the kind of work we do is we work with nonprofits, schools, um, similar organizations, sometimes foundations. And we really work with them to help them understand their communities and also what interventions work in those communities. And we do that by bringing our expertise in evaluation methods and in data analysis, and then kind of pairing it with their expertise in what they do and what they know about their communities. So we use a lot of, um, we do some traditional statistical kind of quantitative analysis, but we also do a lot of um, gathering of information and kind of pairing those different types of expertise and doing um, capacity building, for example. A lot of the nonprofits we work with are maybe just starting to collect data or have a little data. And so we end up spending a lot of time with them on what data are you collecting? Why are you collecting? Why, what, what are you going to do with it? Will it be meaningful? So we really focus a lot of our efforts on that. You know, your expertise is programs and what you're doing. Our expertise is data and evaluation and kind of trying to marry those together so that we can create something that they can use. And that's also has validity behind that. So basically a company would hire you guys to come in and collect the data, analyze it and give them a final report. So that's, yeah, that's one way. Um, and generally, we, um, we don't really work with for-profit companies. We're more working in that nonprofit school sector. And so we have some projects where uh, they maybe get a grant and it requires that you have evaluation. So they, hey, we need somebody to tell us, do we meet our metrics? Do we meet our goals? And so we will do um, that kind of, yes, you know, we tell them how to gather the data we interpret it, we write up reports, and they use that for kind of compliance reporting and for improvement. So that's kind of one arm of it. And the other arm is people who want um, additional methods and things beyond the compliance. So maybe they say, we want to um, we want to have data systems. Right now, we're maybe collecting paper data here and paper data there, and we need to put this together in a way that we can use, or we need to develop some data dashboards for continuous quality improvement. So that's kind of another route that we go. Yeah. Finding the right questions to ask is always very important. Mm -hmm. So I saw on your website that VIA is a majority women owned and led business. Um, Could you tell me a bit about what this means to you? Yeah. So uh, it's something we're really proud of. I have a co-owner, Kamani, who um, is also a woman. And it's something that both of us talk about that um, we both learned a lot of valuable lessons from men in the business and have, have seen different people lead in different ways. But it, it feels good to be representing an underrepresented group because yeah. as we know, there, there aren't as many women who own businesses, there aren't as many women who are leading in corporations. And so to be part of that is, is really exciting. And it is something that we're proud of. But in the end, running a business is still running a business. And so uh, it's not that different, but it is something that I would love to see more diversity of perspective, not just from women, but um, different racial backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different economic backgrounds. The more we can get diversity into leadership and business ownership, I think the stronger we're going to be. And diversity is super important to think about when you're collecting data, because I know that a lot of people, when they don't think about that, they might end up collecting their data in a biased way. So I think that's really great that that's something that's really important to your business. 
Yeah, and we talk about that a lot. We actually just did a whole uh, team meeting today about that, thinking through equity in our evaluation and always bringing that lens to things. That's excellent. So as the co-owner and president, uh, can you tell me a bit about what your main job responsibilities are? Yeah, so because I have a business partner, I'm very, very fortunate in that I don't have to do some of the things that a lot of business owners have to do. Damani is more of the um, traditional business side of things in the sense that she makes sure that our budgets are done, our invoices are sent out, the office is operating, and she has a team to help her with that. And I get to focus more on um, client development and make, helping the staff develop and making sure they have the resources they need to do their jobs well. So it used to be when I was more starting out and was in a, um, an actual project role, I was responsible for um, talking to clients, figuring out their needs, designing evaluation plans, analyzing data, writing reports. I was doing a lot of that. But now in a leadership role, I spend a lot more time making sure we have systems in place and supports in place for our other evaluation staff to do that same kind of high quality work. Yeah. So um, now that you've told me a bit about your responsibilities, could you tell me a bit about what a typical day or a typical week would look like for you? I get asked that question all the time. And the answer is there is no typical one <laughs> because um, but that's part of what makes uh, consulting really fun is that, it's not like you're coming in and doing the same thing every day. Um, there is a flow a little bit to it. I would say in any, in any given week, I'm going to be checking in a lot with the different staff, where are their projects, um, are they running any barriers, um, also just overseeing them in general, making sure that they have development plans and um, what they need. And then I also look into new opportunities, you know, reviewing requests for proposals, reviewing um, if a client calls and says, hey, I need a proposal from you. I'm going to lead up that proposal and work with some other people on it. And then working with Gamani to make sure that we're really communicating our company priorities, especially right now, um, because our 15 staff are all working from home, have been for four months. So there's a lot of communicating <laughs> going on. And we're in the process of rolling out a new five-year strategic plan. So a lot of our efforts are going toward that recently. So it sounds like you spend a lot of your time maybe meeting with people and working with them. So do you spend more of your time in meetings and working with other people or more of your time working by yourself? So when I was on the, the practice side of things, it was, it was more time working by myself. Like I might meet with, um, we have research associates and then we have project leads. And so research associates are more the really diving into the data and the nitty gritty and the, um, Project leads are more thinking, what does the client need? How do our reports look? How do we communicate it? So when I was more in that role, it was um, a lot of independent work, but with some collaboration. But now in a leadership role, that has changed more to the collaboration. Yeah. So I'm sure that you guys are extremely busy, um, but it sounds like you said something about working um, with development plans for your team. So I'm just wondering, are you able to set aside time for personal development or going to conferences or anything like that? And if so, what kind of activities do you do? Yeah, so one of our core values of the company is um, professional growth and development. So it's something that's really important. Um, and it's something that, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who's interested in data science careers or really any career, being a lifelong learner and bringing that to a job is so important. So we really hire people who who are eager to learn more, who are eager to say, hey, there's a webinar, I want to go to this. Hey, there are books I want to read. And um, so that development in the conferences, it can look like, you know, full-on conferences. We send our staff to the American Evaluation Association conference almost every year. But then it's a lot of ongoing things. You know, people are reading articles or books. They're signed up for listservs. Um, they might listen to podcasts. And then we do, um, right now, actually weekly and sometimes less frequently, depending what's going on, we do whole group learning too. Um, and the example was today, we had this whole conversation about how do we bring an equity lens better to our work? What does that mean? What resources do we need? So it really, it, it, it filters through everything that we do. And I think I can't emphasize how important it is when somebody is entering the workforce, 
to show an eagerness for wanting to learn more because you'll often be supported in doing that. Yeah, I'm somebody who works in higher ed, of course. I'm always interested in people getting more education and continuing to learn. I think that's super great. Um, So one thing that a lot of students um, get a little nervous about and a little worried about is doing networking at conferences or events, uh, especially when they're really young and they've never done it before. Um, So I was just wondering, do you have any tips for anyone who's um, doing networking or is new to the experience? Yeah, so networking is it got it's got this bad rap because people think of it as like go and give your card and shake hands and talk to every single person and like put on a face, mm-hmm. um, but that doesn't work for most people and it yeah. it doesn't feel genuine to most people. So um, I am not a natural networker in that sense, but I've learned over time that my style for it is being a really avid listener. You know, if you say to somebody, "Oh, what brought you to this event today?" that's a great little basic icebreaker and you're both there at that event. So you must have some sort of common interest and then kind of listening to what they say, it can then lead to more questions and having that genuine interest in what they're saying um, can lead to a lot of open doors. So it's not about, Hey, this is who I am and this is what I do. It's about, Hey, tell me about yourself and then kind of adapting from there. Uh, That's the way that I really like to network. And then there's also things like LinkedIn um, I've actually gotten to know some people really well from just initially something on LinkedIn. We both commented on something, we connected, and then started having some real conversations. So you've uh, connected with people on LinkedIn that you didn't necessarily meet in person and created like a genuine network connection. That's really cool. Yeah, but it, I wouldn't say, I mean, don't go stalking people. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like I say, we have someone in common or like we both commented on someone in common. It's like, oh, I think there's similar interests. And kind of reaching out, hey, I see that we both uh, are interested in, in, in this aspect of things. You want to talk some time. Yeah. And if people say no, they say no. Yeah. I think thinking of networking more as just an opportunity to meet people rather than I'm going to go in there and get this job or get this interview um, is a really great way of thinking about it. And I think it'll come across a lot more natural than when you're trying to get something from everybody that you meet. Yeah, and even asking for informational interviews, I, I very rarely, I mean, if I'm really busy, I might have to say no, but usually I will take the time to fit those in because it, it's saying, you know, if you say, hey, can I take you to coffee for an hour just to, to hear a little more and you come prepared with some questions. So I just talked to someone and she came, she had a few questions for me, you know, wanted to learn more about consulting. Um, that's a good way to approach people too. Yeah, and it's a great way to learn about new positions. So... Mm-hmm. Um, I was just wondering, what is your favorite part of your job? I really love a lot of things about my job. When I started this job, I was just like, this, this is the job for me. That's I just, great. I, I love so much about it. And I think the thing I love the most is when we watch our clients grow and evolve and how they understand data and how they use data, it's, it's just so rewarding. You know, we're seeing them sit down, go from, hey, we just want to do good in the world and we want to like help this group of people to like, here's how we're going to do it. And then they can go to funders and it makes sense. Um, and then they adapt over time as they see the data saying, hey, maybe you need to tweak this, maybe you need this better. And then they do it better. That's, that is just incredibly rewarding. That sounds really great. So you mentioned that you weren't, um, didn't necessarily think you were going to be a business owner to begin with. So can you talk a little bit about your background and how you ended up in your position? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not what you would typically think. So I think you have a question later we can just answer now, but I was an English major in college uh, with a sociology minor. (laughs) And I thought I'm going to be a journalist or maybe I'll be a professor, you know, read lots of great novels and um, really thought that was more my path. I did not think the path was going to be data. But um, as I got out in the world, I learned that those skills that I had gained, those analytical skills, the having to support your point through what you're reading were really valuable, but can be used in different ways. And I kind of stumbled into a job. I lived in Washington, D.C., and I was in journalism. And I was kind of looking for a new job and ended up working for the National Academy of Sciences. And I It was just great. Then I got suddenly got exposed to this whole world and learned. I did not know what a master's in public health was. 
I had a committee member who was a master's in public health. I asked him about it and I was like, Oh, this sounds really exciting, <laughs> you know? And so when I went back to school to get my master's after, by the way, taking off four years, which was an incredibly valuable thing to do, <laughs> but after four years came with a new perspective and took classes in biostats and epidemiology. And I was like, now I love, I was always good at math, but I didn't love math. And when I saw what I could, could do with it and think about, hey, how can we look at patterns? How can we help people understand disease better? Then I said, I was like, yep, data. We need more data. And my whole public health program is really focused on, obviously, it's, it's, it's public health. You have to have data to inform that. And I just found a whole new love for it and really genuinely enjoying the math behind it, enjoying the concepts behind it. Um, so it, it, it isn't the typical background to it, but that is um, kind of how I came into it. I can tell by the way that you're talking that you really found your passion there, that you're really excited about it. And that's great to hear. So coming from an English degree and moving into a STEM field is a big leap. So was that really a difficult change for you? And do you think having that unconventional background was it a disadvantage or do you think it actually gave you an advantage in the job that you're currently in now? Yeah, so I, I, I see it as an advantage in a lot of ways. Um, I think also, like I said, that, that time off and working, um, when I came into grad school, that I had a much different perspective from having been out in the working world than some of my friends who came straight from undergrad. Um, so it wasn't traditional, but I think it did have a different perspective that some people didn't have. But I'm, I'm a huge advocate, especially for undergraduate, of a liberal arts education because Something I see people new in the field of research or evaluation, um, they struggle with the, the piece of like, what does the data mean? You know, so maybe I can analyze this a hundred ways, but what does this mean in human terms? In, in understanding the humanities, I think really helps you do that bigger thinking. And we talk a lot about this with big data and people who work at Facebook or Google. And it's like, you can analyze all this data, but what does it mean? And what are the implications? And especially when you get into ideas of bias in data and, and thinking through that, I think a humanities education or liberal arts was great for that. Also, specifically with being an English major, it's obviously the writing skills are incredibly important. And something that I hear a lot of professors talk about that really people need to improve their, their writing skills and how they're drawing conclusions, how they're communicating. And my husband happens to be a high school statistics teacher. So I talked to him a lot about this. <laughs> and he does make his students do a lot of writing, a lot more writing than most of the math teachers, because the point of statistics is to communicate some information to people more so than other math, which is really figuring out, for example, in calculus and figuring out a problem. The point is to then communicate that to your average person. So I do think the writing skills are just so incredibly important. Yeah, I think communication is extremely important in any STEM data-based field. And I think that a lot of people who are in those areas don't necessarily realize that. And so if you're able to get those skills, it's really important if you want to go into that area. So um, I'm just curious, when you were really little or when you were in high school, um, did you see yourself in a position like this? I know that you went into English and you mentioned you were thinking you were gonna be a journalist, but do you, did you think at all that you'd end up in the area that you're in now? No, well, one interesting thing is the area I'm in now barely existed. It's evaluation as a, as a field, I mean, it was around, but as a real field and a practice, um, wasn't really a thing. It, there weren't very many people doing it, and so I think that's something that's interesting to think about if you're in high school or college is the thing you end up being passionate about may not even exist, especially in these days as jobs and fields change so quickly. Um, being open to that is, is really important because I never would have thought of, of any of these things. And even being a business owner was not ever high on my list. And I do love it. And it, it makes a lot of sense. But I didn't grow up saying, oh, this is definitely what I want to do. Um, but I also wasn't exposed to it. So I think there's a, I think that's something interesting for people to think about is kind of seeking out exposure to different kinds of careers 
and how helpful that can be. It's just, I hadn't even thought of some of these options because I never was exposed to them at all. Another reason to do informational interviews. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the very last question before we let you go is just, is there anything else that you want our listeners to know that we didn't get a chance to cover today? I, I think we did cover a lot, but I think it's just that there's so many ways to go in data science and that's part of what makes it exciting. Because you can go that route of, I'm going to be collecting millions of data points. I'm going to be doing predictive modeling. I mean, and that's really, really cool stuff. And then there's also the side that's more our side of how we approach things, which is like, okay, I'm going to maybe not do the most advanced statistical analysis, but I'm going to help people understand what these data are saying and how to collect the right data. So there's so much variety within that. And I think there's also a lot of room or change within that. I mean, like I said, I did not think I'd be a business owner. I came into it like, I love looking at data. I'd love to help some organizations. And over time with the right company, you can evolve and say, well, I like these skills, but now I can evolve this skill too. And, and it's just such a, a valuable thing. Um, also, I just think in larger society, especially these days, being a person who understands and can use data is, is just really important. <laughs> People are sometimes making decisions based on very, very faulty analysis or assumptions or pseudoscience and fake data. And being able to be a person who can spot fake data and say to people, hey, you know, maybe this study of 30 people isn't really that robust. And, <laughs> you know, that, that's something that's important in society as well, to be able to share those things. So, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. And to all of our listeners, if you've not already checked out our first podcast, go ahead and check it out now. For more information about starting your career as a data scientist, go to dataanalytics.buffalostate.edu. And don't forget to subscribe so that you get a notification each time we release a new episode. And join us October 1st for the next episode of Buffalo State Data Talk.